you're going to need to click start webinar. Would you like me to do that? Wait, can you say that again? Are you guys ready to start the webinar? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to click start webinar for you guys then. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We will wait just a minute or so while everyone gets logged into Zoom for the webinar. Good morning and thank you for joining us for this webinar for early learning and care contractors. This webinar is being presented by the California Department of Education's Early Learning Care Division and Fiscal and Administrative Services Division. This webinar is being held on October 1st, 2021 and is scheduled to run from 10 a.m. until 11 a.m. And with that, I would like to welcome the Director of the Early Learning Care Division, Stephen Profiter. Thank you very much, Mai. So as Mai mentioned, uh, my name is Stephen Profiter, and I am the Director of the Early Learning and Care Division at the California Department of Education. Uh, so happy first day of October, and welcome to this webinar. We had our last webinar a couple of weeks ago, and here on out and from here on out, our goal is to host these uh, around the beginning of the month. Um, I missed our last webinar. I miss seeing many of you, but I'm grateful to be back with you all. And, and this is uh, as well as this great team uh, that, that's on this webinar here to, to engage with you all. Uh, before we go further into any of the, the content, I want to remind everyone that these webinars hosted by CDE will only include information and guidance for programs that are administered by the CDE. So including the California State Preschool Program, uh, transitional kindergarten and you know, possibly other programs as, as needs arise. Uh, while we appreciate that many of the requirements for programs at the California Department of Social Services are the same or similar to CSPP requirements, we just need to make it clear that uh, as we don't have the authority to address questions related to programs at CDSS, uh, the guidance that we provide here does not represent guidance for, for programs formerly at CDE. Um, I'd also like to pause and acknowledge the incredible work that you are all doing on a, uh, on a daily basis throughout this pandemic. Your tireless work means so much to the children and families of California and of course us at CDE. We know that at almost 19 months in, working in a pandemic is still exhausting, uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Um, but just know that, you know, we're doing what we can to continue to, to support um, uh, it just, again, it's appreciation for, for just beyond the wonderful services that you, you provide to children and families, um, thinking about the stability and the predictability, which is, which is so important for, for children. So, uh, a, a deep heartfelt thank you. Um, 
And of course, as always, as we, we look forward to trying to, to, to working through this, this pandemic and getting beyond it, we will, I just want to encourage you to continue washing those hands, wear your masks, uh, get vaccinated, encourage others to get vaccinated. Um, we're optimistic that soon another cohort of our children will be eligible to receive a vaccine. Uh, this will add another tool to our toolbox and we need to use the tools that we have to fight against COVID-19 and, and make our communities stronger together. Uh, and at this point, I'll, I'm gonna ask Alana to, uh, to join who is our, our moderator today. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alana Andrade and I am a child development consultant here at Early Learning and Care Division. And I'll be your moderator today to help answer your questions and to help make this webinar run smoothly, we have a great team as always. From the policy office, we have consultant Danielle Davies and office technician Mai Dow. From the program quality implementation office, we have education administrator Crystal Devlin and consultants Cassandra Lewis, Richard Miller, Amy Silva, and Nadia Gersey. From the Child Development, Nutrition, and Fiscal Services Division, we have managers Andrea Johnson, Alan Lynch, and Kate Washington. From the Data Research and Planning Office, we have the Data Research Manager, uh, Jane Liang. And from the Director's Office, we have analyst Brianne Rood. I also wanna warmly mention our Technology Services Division uh, who helped put our Zoom link up and running for you today. And as usual, our team is committed to being as responsive as possible. And although we will not be able to answer every question, as usual, we will be taking all questions and turning them into FAQs on, that will showcase on our ELCD COVID-19 webpage. Also, our chat is disabled. We will be able to send links to you there, although you will not be able to chat with us there. Please utilize the Q&A feature. And when you ask questions, please give as much detail as possible so we can give you as much detailed answer as possible. Back over to Steven so we can review our agenda for today. All right, thank you very much, Alana. Um, and as you all can see, this is a, it's a pretty big agenda. Um, so let's, let's get into it. So um, our policy office uh, this morning will provide some updates on using the income charts, so the CDE income charts to determine eligibility and changes to the family fee calculator, as well as uh, family fee redeterminations. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of the frequently asked questions that have been coming in re, uh, regarding transitional kindergarten. And then our PQI team will provide some updates on uh, state preschool expansion and management bulletin 21-13 uh, on program quality. And finally, our fiscal team uh, will provide information for us on the beginning of the year uh, fiscal update letter. And while we work through questions in real time, we're gonna take some time at the end to address some questions that come in through Q&A. And any questions that we don't address in uh, this webinar, we will certainly take back um, and, and look to post as FAQs on our website. And without further ado, I will ask Danielle to present our updates from the policy office. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Um, the first thing that we're going to just um, touch on this morning is the purpose, uh, the purposes of the CDE developed income charts that um, come out yearly in our management bulletins. So the CDE has received a few questions or concerns from contractors about the income ranking table not aligning with income eligibility for state preschool families. And as we're um, because they're getting error reports when they're inputting into CDMIS. Um, and so we want to assure you that CDMIS is, in fact, programmed correctly, and we want to remind contractors, per the directives of Management Bulletin 2109, that contractors must use the schedule of income ceilings in the actual body of the MB itself to determine income eligibility and only use the income ranking table when determining priorities for enrollment, not when determining eligibility. And this is an important distinction because they don't line up all the way when you're looking at eligibility versus priority. And we wanna make sure that um, only eligible families are being enrolled into the state preschool program. Um, this year for the first time, the CDE decided to have the income ranking table 
go up to 100% of the state mean and income, which is the purpose of that is to allow for prioritizing families um, that are over income. As now many of you know, um, first state preschool, there are a lot more situations within the last couple of years that have made it able for a family to be eligible for state preschool when their income is higher than 85% of the state median income or over the income threshold. And so with that, we need to be able to um, prioritize those families. So we had moved that income ranking table up higher so that they can be prioritized correctly. And so contractors would have a tool to be able to do that. Um, when the family is eligibility is not based on income, but on another statutorily allowed factor, such as the family is a current aid recipient, or if the family is experiencing homelessness, or even when a family whose children are recipients of child protective services, or they are identified as being abused, neglected, or exploited, or at risk of being abused, neglected, or exploited, those families um, may have incomes that are higher than 85% of the SMI. So we wanna make sure that they can be enrolled and we know that where their priorities would come in. And then when the child is enrolled in a program operating in the boundaries of, of an elementary school where 80% or more of the students are eligible for free or reduced price meals, um, you can see management bulletin 2104 to know, to, to know all the rules and requirements for those programs, those families also could have incomes over 85% of the SMI. So we wanna make sure that there is um, ways for those families to be prioritized. And then specifically for part day state preschool, we've seen this issue come up when a family has an income that is 15% over the income threshold, or when the child has an IEP, they are not required to meet the specific strict income requirements of 85% of the state median income. And so we wanna make sure that all those families that are enrolling under those other eligibility requirements are able or are being um, prioritized correctly using the income ranking table, but also that they're actually eligible based on the eligible, um, the schedule of income ceilings, which determines eligibility. Um, I know that's kind of a lot and there's two different tables and for so long we've used, um, the, the field has used them interchangeably in a lot of ways, but we really wanna make sure that we are not doing that as state preschool has so many other um, eligibility criteria that really does not align those two tables together. And so we just wanna make sure that it's very clear for the field what the two charts should be used for and what they shouldn't be used for. Um, and so just so everyone is aware, as a result of all these eligibility differences for state preschool, um, we have upped the family fee schedule and the family fee calculator in previous years to allow fees um, going up to families with 100% of the state median and income. So higher income families will pay higher fees. And this year, we decided to align the income table with that family fee schedule. And so doing that, I think, has created some confusion for the field. So we just wanted to come back, clarify what happened. Um, there was also an email sent out on the ELCD distribution list on September 21st, clarifying how this should be um, how the income ranking table should be used, along with guidance about what to do if families were enrolled improperly or inappropriately. And then um, if you have any questions, please reach out to your PQI regional consultant so we can get you the technical assistance that is needed. And then um, we do have some updates to our family fee calculator that I'm gonna go into next. And that is, um, we've received also multiple questions about the family fee calculator um, and contractors using it to determine eligibility for families. And we wanna remind contractors that the family fee calculator should only be used to determine family fees. This calculator does not determine eligibility for state preschool. And we also wanted to notify the field that we're working on an update to this family fee calculator that will have a notification anytime a family is calculated with an income or a family fee is calculated for a family with an income that is over the threshold. So anytime you enroll um, a family in one of those categories for state preschool where they're allowed to have income over 85% of the state median income, it will have a notification that's going to remind the contractor 
just to check eligibility rules for state preschool to ensure that they um, are following the correct eligibility rules when enrolling a family that is over income. It does not mean that just because this notification appears that the family is ineligible. So we wanna make sure that's very clear for contractors. If the notification comes up, it's just asking you to go back and double check to make sure that over income family is meeting a different criteria that allows them to be enrolled. Um, and then it'll allow you to move on and still calculate that family fee with no problem. We just wanted to make sure that there is a flag on there for everyone because there are so many families that can be enrolled over income for state preschool that it is very clear in the key fee calculator that this family may be over income. So please double check eligibility. Um, this update will be completed soon, and then we will notify contractors when this update is complete and it's available on the web on the web page, um, probably through uh, ELCD distribution list email. So look out for that. And um, I just the last thing I wanted to add um, is or move on to is a quick reminder for contractors regarding family fee redeterminations this year. Okay, so then let's see. For family fee redeterminations, we want to note very loud and clear for all contractors to hear and make it very upfront and make sure everyone is aware and reminded that in the directive in Management Bulletin 2112, the redetermination of family fees, the directive has changed from previous years. So previously, when a new family fee schedule was released, contractors were, were required to update all family fees based on the new schedule as soon as the schedule came out. The new directive in Management Bulletin 2112 aligns with state law and 12-month eligibility regulations and does not require contractors to update automatically family fees based on the new schedule. And instead, it points to 12-month eligibility regulation that states that no changes shall be made to the family fee unless the family voluntarily requests the change. So this is important because that means that contractors cannot go back in there and automatically reassess family fees. It has to be based on a change requested by the family or at um, when a family initially enrolls, they can be assessed a fee or when the family recertifies, that's when their fee would be updated. So again, um, family fees can only be assessed in the following instances when a family, well, number one, when a family initially enrolls in state preschool, number two, when the family recertifies for state preschool, or number three, when the family voluntarily requests a reduction to their family fees. And so when a family voluntarily requests a reduction to their fees, um, we want to remind contractors they must follow Title V, Section 18082.3 which states that a family may at any time through their 12 month eligibility um, period voluntarily request to reduce a family fee or increase their certified schedule and shall provide applicable supporting documentation for the requested change. So when the family voluntarily requests to reduce their fee, um, the contractor is required to use documentation provided by the family to reduce the fee if, if their documentation does actually reduce the fee. And then within 10 business days after the receipt of the documentation, the contractor is required to issue a notice of action and then only use that information received by the family to reduce the family fee if that family's fee is actually reduced. Um, as a reminder, you cannot increase a family's fee at any point during their 12 month eligibility, even if their income is increased. If they um, request a uh, reduction and you work out their income and calculate it and it results in an increase. Again, you cannot increase their fee. It can only be reduced. So if um, their income would lead to an increase, you would just um, disregard the income information and um, leave the family's fee as is. So as a reminder, no other changes to the schedule can be made when the family reduces reduces their fee. So you can't change their certified schedule, the hours that they're provided, the services that they get. None of that can be changed when a family just requests to reduce their fee. Um, only the change requested by the family can be allowed at the time when the family requests um, a change. And then not within um, the effective date of any family fee reduction shall be the first day of the subsequent month. So that's just a heads up um, it'll go into effect as soon as possible when it's a reduction to the family fee. Um, and it's important to note here that even though a family may reduce their fee, 
they are at no time required to reduce their certified schedule or service hours. So just wanted to, you know, double back and make sure that's clear. And then um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Steve to go over some frequently asked questions about TK now. Wonderful. Thank you, Danielle. And I know that uh, from, oops, my video is off. Um, I know that from this, this last segment here on, on uh, family fees and, and determinations and assessments and such, uh, there's a lot of questions that have, uh, that have come in and uh, rest of sure, of course, we are addressing those as quickly as possible, but we wanted to um, talk about uh, or share out some information on the uh, uh, transitional kindergarten, some of the questions that have come in. And, uh, the first one that we see here is the um, one that's that's come up a few times. And so we're hoping to provide some, some clarity. So this the, the question is, why are only local educational agencies funded to operate universal transitional kindergarten? Um, and so it, it's essentially our model. So the, the California's um, uh, education guarantee model. So because TK is the first year of a, a two-year kindergarten program, um, it's funded by uh, with Proposition 98 funding. And so that generates uh, the average daily attendance for, for schools uh, and then therefore must be operated by an LEA. So we at the department uh, recognize the, the critical role that uh, the mixed delivery system has um, and will continue to play in building a comprehensive uh, P3 and universal pre-kindergarten system. So we plan to support our contractors to uh, continue providing uh, state preschool with a uh, um, focus on serving younger children and full day, full year, uh, non-traditional hour support to TK children or children that are eligible for TK uh, to ensure that working families have the, the support they need to um, access early education opportunities. Parents continue to have a choice. Um, uh, the budget this year made that clear. And so the parents continue to have a choice between enrolling their, their students, their eligible students, in CSPP, TK, Head Start, or other programs. Um, and el child's eligibility for TK does not preclude uh, that child from attending a, uh, a different program for which, they, they, for which they're eligible. Um, and go to the uh, second question. This is another question that, that came up on uh, the recent uh, P3 webinar. So what is the def definition of an LEA under UTK expansion? Uh, and many of you know that in um, for the purposes of state preschool, uh, LEAs are defined in as um, uh, school districts, um, um, county offices of education, community college districts, and uh, charter schools are included. So um, different parts of education code have different um, clarifying, you know, sections on, on, on what an LEA, what constitutes an LEA for the purposes of UTK, LEAs include school districts, county offices of education, and charter schools. So this definition does not include community college districts. So there's one, one distinction there between UTK and uh, CSPP. Uh, the next question, so if I'm a CSPP within, within a school district, well, oh, I'm sorry, can we go back one more slide? Perfect. Uh, so if I'm a CSPP within a school district, will I have choice to not provide TK? Um, and so if you're a unified or elementary school district, then you're obligated to provide TK. So the district would be required to provide transitional kindergarten. You may continue to contract with the CDE to operate your CSPP program. Um, and if you are a, a community-based organization, other government agency, or community college district, as we, we talked about in the last FAQ, uh, you would not be able to provide TK at this time. And perfect. Uh, the fourth question, so the age requirement for TK. So in this current year, I'm sorry, next year, 22-23, uh, a child who has will have their fifth birthday between September 2nd and February 2nd. This year it's between September 2nd and December 2nd. So next year we're extending it out, the state extends it out two months. So fifth birthday between September 2nd and February 2nd, uh, that child will be eligible for a transitional kindergarten program maintained by the school district or a charter school. 
The law expands TK to serve an additional two months of birthdays until universal TK is fully realized in 2025-26. Uh, uh, and then our, our, our final question that we have for, for this webinar, um, can parents choose between CSPP and TK for their children? Yes, uh, absolutely yes. Uh, there was a change in law this year um, to the definition of a, a CSPP four-year-old that allows for uh, parental flexibility to decide in which program to enroll their child. And I'm going to now ask uh, Crystal to join us to give it, give us an update on some, some PQI topics. Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. So Assembly Bill 131 authorized $130 million in funding for CSPP expansion for fiscal year 2021-22. These funds are available to local education agencies. Although community-based organizations are not eligible to apply for CSPP expansion funding this year, the LEAs that apply may subcontract with the CBO if they choose to do so. We are currently in the process of developing the request for applications and will release it in the near future. <clears throat> While CSPP expansion funds may be used for transitional kindergarten wraparound services to help ensure that families have access to a broader range of service hours in order to meet their need for a full day of service. We are currently reviewing the legal options based on eligibility and program requirements for CSPP. We will provide updated information regarding the use of CSPP expansion funds for TK wraparound services as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now we will cover Management Bulletin 21-13 that provides guidance on implementation of the California State Preschool Program quality requirements during the COVID-19 pandemic, including flexibilities allowed due to the ongoing impacts of the pandemic, which was released on Wednesday, September 29th. While contractors operating a CSPP must adhere to the program quality requirements, of the CSPP contract for children, families, and staff, there are some flexibilities um, for some of the requirements during the COVID-19 pandemic. While I won't be covering the entire management bulletin at this time, as most requirements remain the same as during non-COVID times, I do want to highlight where flexibilities are allowed for fiscal year 2021-22. For the desired results developmental profile, the DRDP, CSPP contractors may continue to use the modified essential view for fiscal year 2021-22. Please note that the CDE strongly encourages CSPP contractors to use, at a minimum, the DRDP essential view in order to obtain critical observations and data and to support children's social and emotional development. This is particularly important during the pandemic due to the additional stressors that children, families, and communities are experiencing and the potential impact on children's development. Additionally, CSPP contractors have up to 90 days rather than 60 days from the child's date of enrollment into the CSPP to complete the initial DRDP. This flexibility does not prevent CSPP contractors for from completing the initial DRDP 60 days <clears throat> from the date of a child's enrollment if preferred by the contractor. We understand that this guidance differs from the Department of Social Services who will continue to require that the initial DRDP be completed within 60 days of the child's enrollment for contract types that they administer. So we wanted to make sure that you are all aware and do not confuse the guidance if you hold contract types other than CSPP. Also, as a reminder, when children are participating in distance learning services because a CSPP contractor is required to close, or when group sizes are limited due to a local or state public health order or guidance related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the teaching staff conducting the DRDP should gather family perspectives about their child's development and behavior to inform the DRDP assessment. <clears throat> the information families provide is important is considered valid data and facilitates partnering to support children's learning and development. When a child is not receiving in-person services due to the family sheltering in place and the contractor is unable to complete the DRDP assessment, the contractor shall indicate unable to rate due to extended absences for the child. 
As a reminder, distance learning services are not required to be offered for families that are sheltering in place and the contractor should encourage families to return to in-person services as soon as possible. While CSPP contractors, including those that provide service through a, a Family Child Care Home Education Network, a FITCHEN, must complete an environment rating scale, an ERS, that is appropriate for the type of setting and age of children served to measure program quality every three years as part of the program compliance review. For fiscal year 2021-22, the assigned CDE ELCD Program Quality Implementation PQI Office Regional Consultant will complete the applicable ERS observation for all on-site monitoring reviews. However, the ERS obser observation results will be used to provide CSPP contractors with technical assistance for subscales that score below a five. Scores will not be used to determine a CSPP contractor's compliance with the terms of the CSPP contract. CSPP contractors will be required to complete the ERS during fiscal year 2021-22 as part of the program self-evaluation, the PSC process, for any classrooms or fiction homes that are open and providing in-person services. Note that CSPP contractors are not required to have the ERS completed by a reliable rater for the purpose of the PSC. Also, please keep in mind that the ERS observations must be conducted in a manner that will not increase the health, health risks to the children and providers. Staff who typically complete ERS assessments on multiple classrooms or family child care homes should ensure that when entering the environment, all individuals take necessary precautions to, pre to prevent the spread of COVID-19, i.e. wearing masks indoors, using personal protective equipment, and practicing uh, uh, hand washing. <clears throat> the Environment Rating Scale Institute, ERSI, has issued updated guidance regar regarding the use of the ERS tools during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please visit the ERSI website for more information regarding this guidance at https semicolon slash slash forward slash forward slash www.ersi dot info forward slash index dot html. As always, if you need additional technical assistance regarding the California State Preschool Program quality re requirements, please reach out to your assigned ELCD PQI office consultant. Now over to Kate to provide you with fiscal updates. Thank you, Crystal. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kate Washington, and I'm a manager in the Child Development and Nutrition Fiscal Services Unit, or CDNFS. The 2021 budget allocated American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, stabilization funding. Recipients of this funding must complete a survey to ensure eligibility prior to receiving the funds. CSPP recipients include individual sites, as well as Family Child Care Home Education Network, or FETCHIN, providers. For CSPP contractors with multiple sites, one survey must be completed for each site. For CSPP contractors operating fetchins, one survey must be completed by each provider. The CDE held a webinar about the ARPA survey on September 17th, 2021. The slides to that webinar are posted on the ELCD COVID-19 guidance webpage, which Andrea will drop a link to in the chat. Also on September 17th, the ELCD released an email communication that included an attachment. The email attachment is a PDF document that includes the questions for the ARPA survey. Please note that the PDF document is not the survey itself, but rather was provided so that contractors can review the questions prior to taking the survey. The survey was provided as a link, which was emailed directly to the program director email addresses provided in CDMIS. If you do not have the link to your survey, please contact your program director. FAQs are expected to be posted soon, but in the meantime, if contractors have questions about completing the survey, please email arpasurvey at cde.ca.gov. As an update to stipend allocations, we are going to start looking at the data we received as of September 30th so that we can process stipends. We're going to try to get those allocations for the first round of stipends out in the month of October. Subsequent rounds will be issued monthly through the end of the calendar year and will be based on data pulled at the end of each month. After the end of this calendar year, we will assess how frequently we need to continue to process allocations. 
DSPP contractors that are applying to receive ARPA funds from DSS must also complete an ARPA survey that is being administered by DSS. This includes contractors that are applying for stipends based on a CSPP program's license capacity. These stipends are being administered by the DSS Community Care Licensing Division. Andrea has also going to drop a link to the DSS webpage that contains information about the licensed provider stipends, including contact information to DSS about these stipends. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now I'll move on to a couple of items we would like to address regarding reporting and caseload assignments. As you know, enrollment, attendance, and fiscal reports for center-based contracts, CSPP, CCTR, CMIG, and CHAN, as well as CRRP, and the support contract types, CPKS, CCIP, CHST, and CLPC, are all submitted through CPARIS. Contractors will continue to submit these reports in CPARIS, our web-based system. Because reports are now submitted electronically rather than on paper with a signature, each contractor must submit what is called a certification of assurances prior to submitting any reports in the system. The certification of assurances is a statement acknowledging that the electronic certification of reports by authorized representatives replaces official signatures on paper submissions. While there is no limit to the number of users any agency may assign the role of authorized representative, the certification of assurances must be completed only once per year by one authorized representative. Part of the statement in the certification of assurances acknowledges this, requiring the user who submits it to provide the information and requirements for electronic signature to all authorized representatives at your agency. You will be unable to certify any reports until the certification of assurances has been completed. The certification can be found in the reporting tab of CPARIS under current forms. And again, that is a yearly requirement so that it only needs to be filled out just once per fiscal year. Now I'll move on to an update on CDNFS caseload. As part of the transition of child care and development programs to the Department of Social Services, the CDNFS fiscal analyst caseload has been updated. The fiscal analyst directory will now reflect assignments by both county and department. This reassignment will be effective October 11th. The updated directory will be posted to CDE's website next week and will also be linked in our beginning of the year letter, which will also be posted and sent as a listserv next week. Next slide, please. Now I would like to cover a topic related to CSPP contracts. First, as a reminder, Assembly Bill 131, Section 263 specifies that for fiscal year 2021-22, CSPP contractors are to be reimbursed the lesser of 100% of the contract maximum reimbursable amount, MRA, or net reimbursable program costs. In order to be reimbursed pursuant to the limits defined in AB 131, CSPP contractors must meet one of the criteria outlined in Management Bulletin 2111. Contractors must either one, open to provide in-person services in accordance with the agency's approved 2021-22 program calendar and remain open and offer services through the 2021-22 program year, or two, not provide in-person services by the start date of the approved program calendar due to local or state public health order or guidance that prevents the program from reopening, or three, open for in-person services in accordance with the approved program calendar with any future days of closure being due to a local or state public health order or guidance. If a CSPP closure is due to any other reason other than being closed due to a local or state public health order or guidance, or have an approved non-COVID-19 emergency closure, the contractor will not be reimbursed for any period of time that the CSPP is not physically open to provide in-person services. Contractors who do not meet the reopening criteria in MB 2111 must submit a revised 2021-22 program calendar and a program narrative change to their assigned PQI consultant to ensure that the correct minimum days of operation are reflected in their contract. The contract will also be amended to prorate the MRA to reflect the correct days of closure. Contractors who do not meet the criteria will again be reimbursed the lesser of net reimbursable program costs and the total contract amount. Attendance is not a factor for reimbursement in this fiscal year. Now I'll turn it over to Alana for the Q&A portion of the webinar. Thank you. Definitely my favorite part of the webinar. The team has been actively answering open questions and I know that we still have a lot of team members who are responding. So let's see what we can pull out first. There were some questions around parental choice and TK. 
So I'd like, I think that was uh, Danielle to come back on and just repeat. Uh, we could either have you repeat part of the slide. Um, I think some folks were just confused about if the uh, families could choose CSBP versus TK at the moment if it was a parental choice. But perhaps I think it was actually Stephen who uh, spoke about that. So I'm going to actually call Stephen. Yeah, happy to. Uh, looking to see if was there a particular question? Because otherwise, I mean, the the um, just I'll restate what's in the budget. Right, the budget says that uh, um, a child's eligibility for um, TK does not preclude. Um, or and thus prevent their enrollment um, in a program besides TK, that they may be eligible. So for instance, if a child is eligible for the California State Preschool Program, then they may be enrolled in the California State Preschool Program instead of in the Transitional Kindergarten Program. It's the, uh, it's the parent's uh, choice um, as to which, uh, which program makes the most sense for, for, for the parent and the family. Perfect, thank you, Steve. Let's see, we did have some questions about the income charts and family fee calculator. And I do know Danielle did present those earlier. <laughs> so Danielle, I'd like to ask you to unmute yourself. There was some confusion around the two charts and perhaps we can just go over uh, a few of the questions were already answered. Let's see if I can pull one up, but there were definitely a lot of questions regarding, now there's two choices that we have, but it's not really two choices. Yeah, if you have a specific question, that would be helpful. I didn't see those first ones that came in while I was reading, so or while I was talking. So, um, if you have a specific question or comment that was made, that'd be helpful. If the fee will be lowered with the new fee schedule, the parent still has to request it. That is correct. So, with the twelve-month eligibility regulations and the way our statute is written in California, if a family, even with the change in the new family fee schedule, um, even if it would lead to a decrease in family fees, um, contractors are not allowed to change anything without parents or families voluntarily requesting to do so. Um, and at any time, parents during their 12-month eligibility, parents can request a reduction. And um, just to note, as it did in the management bulletin on the family fees, we strongly encourage all contractors to remind families of their ability to voluntarily request a reduction. So if you do notice that, hey, this family could benefit from this new fee schedule um, based on the income, we encourage you to let them know, hey, you should request a reduction because then your fee could be lowered because of this. Okay. There were a few more. Let's see, um, for you, Danielle. There was one about if you're not supposed to, if we're not supposed to update the fees per the new fee schedule, is it okay to have the amount of waived fees per last year's fee schedule? Yeah, that is correct. So you will have whatever the family's fee currently is will be the amount that's waived when you're reporting. So whether it's last year's fee schedule, this year's fee schedule, um, it's going to be whatever is applicable to the family at the time in which you're reporting. Okay. Let's see what else I can pull out. There has been some requests in the chat about the process that you were referring to, Crystal. Um, Let's see if I can pull it up here. There, I, there was some clarification about the DRDP and about how long it would take to complete. Um, I'm not, <clears throat> so we do not give guidance on how long it will take you to complete it. However, you have up to 90 days to complete the initial uh, DRDP observation on the child. Okay. Thank you. Then Crystal, can you also speak to, and my apologies if, if you were not the presenter for this, on the full day CSPP expansion funds and where they are now? 
So we are currently working on the request for applications for the CSPP expansion funds and hope to release that in the near future. Excellent, thank you. And then Kate, there's a few questions here for the ARPA survey. Um, a few folks are just asking for confirmation about will there be a CDE ARPA survey and a DSS ARPA survey? Thank you, Alana. Uh, there will be a CDE and a DSS ARPA survey, although if there's additional detail to add to that, I would call on Andrea. Well, let's call on Andrea. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I did, I am also responding um, in the Q&A, but I did want to clarify some things. Um, and I, we do understand that there is some confusion because um, there are two surveys and while they are similar, there are definitely some differences. Um, so I did want to clarify that for the CDE survey, that the reason why we are only asking you to submit the survey once is because within the survey, we will collect site level information for all of your sites in one survey. So that I think is the primary difference between the DSS and the CDE survey um, that we're just collecting all that site level information within one survey. And so that's why we're asking for you all to only submit one response um, because that will only need you know, the information one time because we're collecting it all within the one survey. So I hope that makes sense. The other thing that I did want to clarify, and um, Kate also said this um, when she was going over her slide, but just want to make sure it's clear that we were encouraging you all to submit your survey by September 30th. Um, that is not a deadline. We are going to continue to administer these funds um, in the upcoming months and for you know, as long as the funds are available, we are just really wanting to be able to get the funds out more quickly. And so what we are trying to express is that the sooner you can submit that survey, the sooner we can issue stipends um, to you all. So I just wanted to make that clear that the September 30th is not a hard deadline. Um, and like Kate stated, uh, we will pull that data um, periodically so that we can continue to issue stipends. So just the sooner you can uh, submit that information, the sooner we can get the funding out to you for the stipends. Thanks, Alana. Excellent. And Andrea and or Kate, um, there was a question about, um, so we are an LEA that has multiple licensed schools. Is it possible to know which school will submit the survey? So we're not, um, that is really up to the contractor. So you can make that decision on who is submitting the survey. We're, we're not um, like, you know, specifying which, uh, who exactly has to submit the survey. It's just, we need a survey to be submitted on behalf of the contractor. Excellent. And then one other um, thing while I'm on, while we're on this topic, Alana, um, I also see some questions about if the ARPA survey link was sent. Um, and the answer is yes, it was sent to the uh, program director. So those that have access to CDMIS, um, where you submit your um, enrollment data to the ELCD, um, the individual that is identified as a program director, that email address um, that is in CDMIS, that is the email address that the link to the ARPA survey was sent to. So if you have not received it, please um, first reach out to the program director, um, ask them to check their email, see if they received the, the link to the survey. Um, if they have not, we can certainly send it to you again. You can just email that, that email box, the ARPA survey at cde.ca.gov, um, and we can resend that. Perfect. It also looks like someone put in one of the surveys into the chat or the Q&A, I should say. Okay, let's see uh, what I'm else. Sorry. I was just commenting was that, that it looked like somebody put the link in. Oh. Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> sorry to confuse you, Andrea. Okay. No problem. Um, one, sorry, Alana, I'm going to take one more really quick because <laughs> sure. I see a lot of them coming in right now. Um, there's a question about what if you completed it at, um, 
more than once. Um, please um, just send, uh, I mean, we're going to be reviewing. So we know that that is, you know, going to happen, um, certainly. So we are, of course, going to be reviewing the data. Um, if there's any discrepancies between the two survey responses, we'll need to reach out. Um, so, for example, if one individual responded with different responses than another individual at your program, um, we may need to reach out to make sure that we have the, the accurate responses, um, but it won't prevent us from, from issuing funds. We'll just have to take that extra step to contact you and make sure we have the right information. Perfect. Okay, well, let's uh, pivot a moment. I'd like to ask Crystal to come back. There's a few questions about the Eckers. First, is it required for this year and will it be needing to be done for each classroom? So yes, the, the environment rating scale. And so this might also be for a family child care home education network provider. So it could be, would be the Eckers for a center-based program. It would be the, the Fickers for a family child care home. It is required to be used for your program self-evaluation. And when consultants are conducting in-person um, monitoring reviews, it will be um, the, the ERS, the appropriate ERS will be used um, for the purposes of technical assistance only. It will not be used to determine compliance with the terms of the contract. And yes, for any classroom or um, family child care home that is open and providing in-person services for the program self-evaluation, the, the appropriators will need to be completed on each of those. For each, excellent. Okay, let's see. There, there have been a few questions about confusion of what is considered TK wrap and wraparound services. So I'd like to ask Steve to come back and just sort of give a explanation of what a TK wraparound service can look like. And also a CSVP funds can be utilized for that. Great, great. And I think this is a good thing to clarify because we often use the term wraparound, but wraparound actually has multiple meanings. So when we say wrap, around. We're, we're talking more, thinking more along the lines of providing the full day uh, services that, that families need. So um, the before school and after school uh, uh, care that some families need uh, for preschool age children. Um, there is guidance that we are, we, we will be developing um, around this. And naturally there, it, it's not as, as simple as saying, um, if you have a state preschool program, you could provide before and after school care. There are program requirements and there's eligibility requirements to navigate a, as part of this. So um, I'd say stay tuned on, uh, on, on additional uh, guidance for the wrap. Thank you, Steve. There is another question about CSPP expansion funds. So either Steve or Crystal. The question is, will the CSVP expansion funds be available to all CSVP contractors, including full day CSVP availability? So yes, the, um, it, the CSVP expansion funds will be available um, for all existing contractors, both part day and full day that are a local education agency. So as a reminder, community-based organizations will not be eligible to apply for the CSVP expansion funding uh, for for this fiscal year. <clears throat> However, uh, an LEA may decide to uh, subcontract out to community-based organizations. Okay, thank you. So either Kate or Andrea, there's some questions that have come in about if a classroom is in a 10-day quarantine period and how that might affect their reimbursement. A tag team. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is or a. Kate. Uh, oh, did, I, did Kate come up? Okay, I'll mute. Well, whoever has the answer. 
I think this this may be getting at like the what's reported in in, in terms of, of attendance versus versus an enrollment, and then how does reimbursement work in, in in that light? That's that's how I'm hearing the question. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Steve. Um, so there is uh, going to be information that will be included in the beginning of the year letter that will be released next week that goes into some information about how to report attendance because there is some nuance there. Um, so what I would say is look to the beginning of the year letter for the answer. And if that does not answer your question, then you can always reach out to your fiscal analyst. Um, we are, again, not reimbursing based on attendance this year. So uh, it is important that you report your attendance correctly. Uh, and again, the guidance will be in the beginning of the year letter, but that will not impact your reimbursement this year. Excellent. Thank you. So I'd like to call Danielle back. There's been some question about abandonment of care and at the 30 days. So one question that um, has come in is when families have abandoned the program for 30 days or more, and we have not been able to contact the family via phone calls or emails, are those absent days excused or unexcused? Hi, Alana. Thanks. Um, yeah. So for all things for abandonment of care, if the family has abandoned care and they meet the requirements and the contractor has done all the requirements of reaching out and trying to contact the family, that's required from um, regulations in section 18066.5. Um, and again, let me just repeat that. It's 18066. 066.5 is the abandonment of care section. Um, and it's pretty, it outlines the process for which that happens. All of those have to be unexcused absences. Otherwise, if they were excused, we would know why the family was not in care. And that means the family would have not abandoned care. They won't meet that definition. So it only is applicable for unexcused absences in which we do not know the, the family has not contacted the contractor or the provider and that you guys are unaware of why the family is not in care. Okay, thank you. And then Danielle, there's been some questions about where to find that schedule of income ceilings chart and the income ranking table that you described earlier. Yeah, so both of those are in Management Bulletin 2112. They, that is the family fee management bulletin. The income ranking chart is a um, Excel document that's with sit within the, the management bulletin that will link you to an, like an Excel document that opens. And then the income ceilings chart, the schedule of income ceilings is actually in the management bulletin and is not a separate link itself. Okay. So while the team is continuing to answer the questions that are still coming in, and these are some really good questions. We really appreciate your, you being here today and, and engaging with us. I'll ask Mai to move the slide and I'll share with you our resources um, while our team is continuing to answer these questions. So uh, all of our management bulletins and including presentations from our webinars, uh, the slide decks and the frequently asked questions that are derived from the Q&A, those can be found on our ELCD COVID-19 guidance webpage. And that's https colon forward slash forward slash www.cde.ca.gov forward slash sp forward slash cd forward slash RE, forward slash ELCD COVID-19 dot ASP. You can also email us at the ELCD emergency email inbox at ELCD emergency at CDE dot CA dot gov. And to find a list of the program quality implementation offices regional consultant directory, please visit HTT ps colon forward slash forward slash www.cde.ca.gov forward slash sp forward slash cd forward slash the i forward slash assignments dot asp. Consultants are most re uh, easily reached by email. However, during business hours, you can also call the consultant of the day, which is at 916-322-6233. And I'd like to call back Stephen to help close us out for today. 
Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you, team. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining and engaging with us today. It's, it's clear from all the, the questions, the Q&A, um, that with everything going on, uh, we really could probably spend a couple of hours each week doing this. Um, unfortunately, we have to also work on getting guidance out and, and uh, <laughs> other things. Otherwise, we'd love, to, we'd love to spend a lot more time with you. Um, but we, we have enjoyed our, our time together this morning. Um, we appreciate you know, your, your strength and, and your passion for this work. That's, that's what's helped us get to where we are. Um, and you are, you know, you are essential, right? It's, you know, 19 months in, right? We want to make sure that doesn't go away. That reality never goes away. You are essential. Um, your contributions to children and families, um, you know, helps shape their, uh, shape their future far beyond these, these early years. So thank you for everything that you do. Uh, we hope you have a, a wonderful Friday, wonderful weekend, and uh, wonderful just everything until we connect again. Thank you.